And so what I want to what I do is I want to just do a couple of things. One is, is trace a bit of, of kind of how I think this is important. But in a sense, I want to constitute a proposal of what I think we, as, a, as the big collective we, can kind of do to make some of the work we do fit our ethics better, just to put it very plainly. And so part of what I'm talking about is the use of, of critical theory. Part of what I'm talking about is the use of um, feminist theory, and specifically feminist research methods. I think that has the, most, the, the richest kind of opportunities. So, so let, me just, um, let me just hop into what I'm talking about. Okay, so the, the, the background, which I think is, is somewhat important, is that I, I found myself in, uh, in 2009, after completing a master's degree and before beginning a PhD, um, being given the opportunity to teach uh, terrorism studies, um, but specifically to teach terrorism studies in a, a particular political institution at, at Georgetown University, um, specifically to an institution which provides training for more people in the study of terrorism than anywhere else in the, in the world. Uh, te Georgetown offers more courses on terrorism than, other, than any other institution. Uh, Georgetown graduates most of these types of people, or at least uh, more than any other single institution. If you look at the, I think this is a very interesting experiment, but if you go to the Wikipedia page of Georgetown and the famous alumni section, instead of having the, the groupings which you may expect, the groupings are very heavily influenced the military, industrial complex, and government. Um, most of the former directors of the CIA, uh, NSA, FBI, et cetera, et cetera. A lot of foreign service people with the US Department of State, um, et cetera, et cetera. These two gentlemen on the bottom, who I'm sure we all know, um, Georgetown University grads, uh, at the first semester in which I was teaching terrorism studies there, um, not only um, at the same university, but literally at the exact same time slot, was uh, former Tech Secretary of State Madeleine Albright, as well as um, uh, Uribe, the former and pretty unliked president of the nation of Colombia. Um, so again, we have this kind of expectation of what we're going to say about terrorism when it's Madeleine Albright, the president of Colombia during the large siege and war against the FARC, and, and me. Um, and, um, and I don't mean to present it as that uh, myself as the only counterbalance to that. There are other counterbalances. I'm not sure there's other people doing terrorism counterbalance at that specific institution, but, but people in this room constitute some of the counterbalance to that. Um, the other kind of opportunity that we, in which I've had to do some of this work is at the University of Malta, um, specifically the, um, the MEDAC, which is this Middle Eastern, uh, Mediterranean, I forget the acronym, it's very long, but it's the Center for Diplomatic Studies. And I was teaching graduate students who were doing Mediterranean security. So you can kind of get an image. And they, and they were, it's a long story, but they're, they're more left than you'd expect because they're populated largely from uh, the School for Conflict Analysis and Resolution at George Mason University. It's kind of the, the host institution. But anyway, um, in both of these institutions, what I think is extremely important to, to think and, and what really was very, <laughs> I was made very aware of, is that it's highly likely that the people I'm explaining terrorism to in this room will one day be able to actually enact violence. It's not abstract. I'm not teaching English majors an introduction to Al-Qaeda. Right? That, that's not what I'm doing. I'm teaching people how to understand what is and is not political violence and terrorism. And based on the record of Georgetown, it is highly likely, both quantitatively and just, just logically, that some of these people will go on to work for the CIA, the NSA, the FBI, US Department of Homeland Security, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Now, I know for a fact that this is true. I know for a fact that some of my former students have gotten these jobs. Um, I know for a fact that some of my students are working uh, in places like Mogadishu and Kabul and Baghdad. I, I know this because they tell me. And so I think that the, the first kind of thought was that we have to find a way to, to speak about political violence and we have to find a way to investigate political violence and research political violence that is ethical. And, and yes, we all agree that's why, that's why I'm doing this presentation here. Um, but I think it's more than that, and I, and I think that one of the ways in which we can do this is through a kind of what I would call an anti-security perspective, right? A perspective that, that de-centers security as what we should be focusing on. Um, I'm not sure Alexander Haig and Donald Rumsfeld would agree, um, but, I, but I would propose using some of the, the, the kind of contributions from feminist research ethics to do this. And so these, oh, I'm moving this like this is actually doing it. <laughs> so these are the, 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 the sorts of um, actors I look at, right? Um, and it's a range. I attempted to show a range. Um, so we have the female fighters in the, uh, in the YPG and the YPJ, 
um, on the upper left, the people fighting in, in Syria. I, I show that because I do a lot of stuff at the congruence of gender and political violence, the role of women, the role of, the, of gendered discourses in political violence. Um, mm -hmm. I look at domestic social movements, right? It's things that I would strongly, strongly advocate are not terrorism in any sense, but are, are in the continual political violence. So I have a, um, a very iconic image here. Many of you may recognize in the upper right from the, the rioting in Ferguson. Um, I look a lot at uh, document, uh, uh, content analysis, and discourse analysis. So the, here's a communique, one of the larger communiques from the Red Army faction. I look at a lot of texts like that at the words. Um, in the middle, this is uh, an image that was put out on the Telegram account of Islamic State following the Orlando shootings. Um, it's one of, um, in many, it's the one I picked was least disgusting and, and least traumatic. Um, but yeah, so that's the range, if that gives you an idea. Um, but, but, but again, I, I look a lot at propaganda, you know, how propaganda is used by non-state actors. And, and on the left is, is one that I actually ideologically find to be quite pleasant, um, but Bite Back magazine, it's an it's a animal liberation front supportive magazine. And so again, I'm showing these because I think it's a range of political violence and it's a range of different ways I'm talking about terrorism. So that's kind of the first thing I want to say, is that when we talk about political violence to our students and, and the different folks that we may talk about this too, that we need to give them the, a more complete picture, right? A more diverse picture of what we're talking about. It's not just brown and black bodies in foreign, Asian and African and Middle Eastern countries, right? This is, this is the range of political violence and, and I think we could expand this somewhat infinitely. So, again, I'm, I'm concerned with the investigation of political violence, but also the kind of de-othering of political violence, right? The, the you know, the, the, the de-essentializing of it, maybe we could say. Um, and and I, I set this up just to show in a very broad strokes kind of where I see these two trends. So if we're going to kind of create a dichotomy, and we all know the problems with creating binaries and dichotomies and whatnot, we, but, but I would create this between uh, orthodox and critical, just to make the term simple, right? And, and one, as, as I'm doing very subtly with this police line, um, it, it shows that these, these fields don't typically integrate, right? And on the one side, you have, you know, again, in the field of terrorism studies, you have very canonical journals. You have basically two journals which, you know, kind of have the authoritative voice on what is terrorism. Terrorism and political violence is one of them. One is, and coincidentally, one is published from Georgetown University, and one is published uh, at the Center for the Study of Terrorism and Political Violence at St. Andrews, where I did my master's degree. Um, which is the other very, very conservative, old, old guard terrorism school. So you have on, on the left, you have the state, as shown by the FBI. You have the kind of uh, centrist academy, which is the journal. And then you have these, these, these institutions. We could put Georgetown's program on security studies in there. We could put a lot of institutions. Um, we could put some stuff in, in, certainly in London and other parts of the world. And on the right, we have a, we have a different tendency, right? Characterized by, by a number of tendencies. Um, there are counterbalances to this. They're certainly less widely uh, circulated and certainly less widely understood to be the authoritative voice. Um, but, but again, you have, you have sort of different ethics, right? You have uh, postmodernism, you, uh, you have critical theory, right? Foucault and, and, and Butler. Um, and then you have the kind of generalized, more generalized ethics, I would argue, associated largely with, with peace theory and anti-authoritarian political discourse, um, most notably anarchism, most notably an anti-state, anti-capitalist um, critique, a horizontalist critique, etc. And, and these are some of the tendencies. I'm not gonna, I won't go through these individually. Um, we're, all, we're all super literate, I'm sure. Um, but again, there's a couple that I think are important, right? One is that the feminist or the critical side of this is based in excavating marginalized knowledge, right? And excavating is a very intentionally used word. It's used by lots of people for very important reasons. It, it's also looking at um, <laughs> You know, challenging the hierarchies, right? Inherently, the, the challenge is to make those hierarchies somewhat uh, more malleable, or at least, in a better sense, disappear. Okay. And so I want to say that, and again, this isn't to kind of to dumb it down, but I want to speak broadly about why I think that feminist, feminist theory is specifically well situated for this. And so this is a broad principle, right? So one is that it, it takes up issues of power and authority and ethics and positionality. And it's inherently reflexive, right? That, that, that's meant to be part of it. So you know, the, the role in which we play both as teachers, practitioners, victims is important. I spoke about a little bit about this last night, but you know, one thing that really interests me personally, what I would love to have a, a, a stable job, to, to say the least of nothing of a sabbatical to, to kind of think about and write, is you know, what is the, the role of trauma in this? We, I said this last night, but we read, testimonies of horrific things, many of us, right? We watch 
Um, I said this last night, but I've probably seen, you know, a hundred people beheaded in, in this last year on video because I try to stay conversant in what propaganda is being put out. I'm sure we've read testimonies from survivors of horrific atrocities. And I think that we have to be, be cognizant of, of what that does to us. Um, and so the other, the other part of it is that we, we tend to work on the margins, and I think that that should be embraced, not, not scuttled. And that we inherently seek social change. Again, this is where people start to shuffle uncomfortably, but I hope don't hear, right? That we want our research to be political, right? Knowledge construction is political, to, to use the, the shorthand of Foucault. You know, that, that this is a political project, that what is and is not studied is a political decision. And so, so one of the things, and again, I, I apologize because I made this comment last night, but one of the ways I think we can do this, and I think this is a very easy to approach, but, but small way, is to encourage people to read primary source documents. So this is the example I have, right? We have a book on Islamic State, and we have, this is actually not, yeah, and we have a, a, a document, right? Read the documents. Read the communiques. Read the, again, this, the, the excavating knowledge. If you want to find how to do this, I will happily help you. It's in English. It's made for consumption. I'm not saying you should agree with it. I'm not saying you should embrace it. I'm not saying you should join the jihad, but I'm saying that you should be, you should understand what the, what the discourse is. You should read it for yourself. And you shouldn't read the FBI's dumbing down of it and the FBI's interpretation of it for you. You should read it and you should make your own decisions. Not because I think it's going to sway you, but because I think you should understand. So this is some, some of the, some of the, uh, the, the kind of texts, which I think really help. At the last slide here, which I'll leave up, has a, a bibliography of about seven articles, which I think really concise, concisely make this point. So I can show that to you. But, but there's a couple, right? So one is um, from a, a, a woman named Harmony Torres, who's a critical societies and terrorism scholar who's, who really does brilliant, brilliant work. I would highly encourage you to, to read her work. Um, but she says that the, the conscious choice of trying to speak with co-participants, so again, she's speaking methodologically here about, about the use of ethnography and in interview in, the, uh, in interviewing, quote, terrorists. It says the conscious choice of trying to speak with co-participants rather than speak for research subjects, of trying to mitigate the structural violence often present in the positionality of the researchers vis-a-vis -vis co-participants, and to engage in research that keeps a constant overall aim the, uh, that's obviously transcribed a lot, but you, you get the kind of intent. Right? Part of this is the notion that there are inherent power imbalances, and we're all aware of this. And again, to, to embrace this, to integrate this into the methodological components, again, I'm intending to propose some kind of points of methodology here, and I think that that's an important one. And so the feminist method, you know, this is a, a quote, uh, you know, seeks to challenge multiple hierarchies of inequality within social life, and thus a feminist method or epistemology may not be a distinct approach, but overlays this political project atop knowledge building, right? So I'm suggesting we, in a sense, use a set of ethics atop the research methods and the, the research matters we are here quite familiar with. And I want to just give a, a few examples of this. One is that, you know, here's a list of feminist research ethics. I'm not going to go through them. I'll let you guys read them as I, as I speak. But one is that, you know, it, it draws on the insights and struggles of marginalized and challenges the encircling of knowledge claims by those occupying privileged positions. And, and I want to show this example. This is a really interesting project of basically crowdsourcing drone strikes. Okay? So you live in Sana or you live in Mogadishu or you live in Fallujah or you live wherever. Um, and, and you you know, see a drone and it blows up a house. And so you go on your phone and you drop a pin. You drop one of these little pins. And so they're crowdsourcing information about how drone strikes are. They're able to collect much richer data. Well, if you can imagine, the people who are pinning that data are marginalized, right? It's not, it's not Alexander Haig or Donald Rumsfeld, right? It's, it's an Iraqi or a Sudanese or whoever the, the, the person is. But it's a, typically a brown or, or black body, right? It's not a, a, a non-subjugated person. And so... To use that, and I was really inspired when, when that sort of knowledge was actually, in a sense, deemed legitimate and used in this way, in a, in a, in a, in a conjunction way, right? So that so-called legitimate academics and government institutions were kind of embracing the fact that people, you know, on the other end of this violence were actually creating some of this data. That, to me, is actually so, somewhat exemplary of what we should be doing. And the other thing is, obviously, to embrace both activism and collaboration, right? Collaboration is something that I'm, I think we're all in favor of, but not something that, that is generally seen as, as essential in the investigation of violence. But because of issues of trauma, because of issues of positionality, because how we understand violence is inherently linked to where we sit on, on, on a number of different um, continuums, I think that we have to collaborate on this. And then we have to use the, the work inherently for social change. Um, I hate the word activism, but that's the word that was used in the article, so inherently for activism. I would argue that a lot of this has to do with emotion and trauma. And that's what I think is the real contribution of the, of the, of the feminist approach. Is, again, the embracing of this 
there's an underlying bias, which I, I understand that we, we're probably all familiar with, that the researcher is an objective, value-free truth finder. That we are this blank slate who measure everything accurately, decide what's true, and, and we present it. But that's not only false, but in my argument, undesirable. I don't claim to be, nor do I want to be, objective. I, I'm not. And anyone who says they are, I think, is, is not being honest. Right? I'm informed by a set of values and ethics and principles, and, I, and I'm proud of that. And so I think that the task of research, especially emotionally charged research, like explaining how, how political violence happens, as, as you can see in these, these recent images, affects us on an emotional and spiritual level. And I think we should embrace that, not say, no, 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 I'm able to speak about subjectively. Like, oh, I know, I know that uh, my mother was a victim of domestic violence, but I can speak about domestic violence objectively. Right? No, that, that's false. Right? We should embrace these, these histories, and we should, we should be somewhat, uh, and this is a tricky statement, we should be somewhat transparent about what has informed us. I'm not saying we all have to you know, empty the skeletons of our violent past, but I think that to be transparent of our positionality is somewhat helpful. And that there's a, there's a value in reflecting on how we respond, right? how we feel doing the research. There's a value in that. And again, I'll show you some articles, but there's some great ideas about how to do this, you know, like natural methods for doing this. So I have two more slides. Again, this is something that I think is really great. Nancy Shepard Hughes, who I'm sure some of you know from the, who's an anthropologist, puts an, an article out which is extremely dense. I, I don't like reading it, but I think it's a very important article. Um, this, this, the pr primacy of ethical proposition for militant anthropology, which obviously informed the title I'm using. Um, and, and so what she says is, one, is that what's called objectivity is not objectivity. It's just the position of a dominant worldview, right? If we're claimed to be objective, that means we're pro-worldview, that is the, the contemporary world blue, worldview. So it's not objectivity, it's just promotion of the status quo. And two is that cultural relativism, which is something that's very common in a lot of these conversations, is not actually appropriate without an ethical grounding. We can't just say, you know, you know why do people engage in, in FGM? Well, that's just their culture, right? Well, well, well no. I mean, there, there, is some, there, there is certainly a cultural analysis in a lot of things, but to accept claims... You know, for instance, I say, you know, moral policing, you know, going around and, and, and physically policing based on morality, right? That we don't accept these things just as culturally relative. We oppose them based on an ethical disagreement. And so she uses the term militant, which I think is actually uh, kind of awesome. I think that's great. And she says that militant must challenge the aims of remaining detached. That we don't have to remain detached. Why should we remain detached? We should be a participant in this. And I cite some examples I, will, I don't have time to go into, but I've produced work to be used to defend People call terrorists, uh, leftists, uh, animal rights activists. And I've produced quantitative data so that the North American Animal Liberation Press Office, which has often been called a terrorist organization, can use my research because I want them to use my research because I've done the, the quantitative data which makes their argument more legitimate. And I've used my credentializing to make their argument more legitimate. This is the last thing I'll show. So this is in a sense the proposal I'm making, as, as much as you can make a proposal. I mean, one is that we should embrace militancy. We need to you know, re-politicize the research process. And I think a lot of us in this room are doing this, right? I think we're at the, you know, some of us are at the forefront of this. Some of, us, some of us are not. Some of us do somewhat still detached research on peace. I'm advocating against that. Um, I'm also saying that we should do embedded and effective, not detached and objective, right? That when we read of, of horrific things, that it's okay to, to acknowledge that in the research process and in the research reporting. That doesn't have, we don't have to kind of be like, no, 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 I'm okay, I'm above that, I can, I can get beyond that. I think that's silly. Three is that I think it should be action-oriented, community-based, participatory research. I don't have time to go in it, but I, I, I spoke about this yesterday, but I was involved in a project that, it, that, that attempted to um, set the groundwork for the provision of abortion services if abortion was made illegal. And we worked to try to figure out how to provide safe and, and, and available uh, abortion services in a, in a post-Roe world. This is during the George W. Bush years. Um, and, and I think that that was really important research. Right? It was action-oriented. It was based in the community. It was involving abortion providers. I was working for an abortion provider. That's why I did. Um, so uh, fourth is I think that there has to be a co-construction of knowledge right? that, that challenges state power. I think that's, that's somewhat in, inter, interwoven. That it has to be contextual and intersectional. Again, this is the direct contributions of feminist theory. That it has to be subject-centric, not state-centric, right? to de-center the state as the unit to be protected. This is a major contribution of security studies from about almost 20, 20 years ago now. That there has to be transparency in the process, that we should be as transparent as possible, both about how we're doing it as well as our position. And, and, and three, or last, and this is what I, what I spoke of interestingly, is that we have to make sure our research is used the way we want it to be used. 
right? To make sure our work is used with the intentionality we design it for, to not endanger our research subjects, to make the criminalization of dissent easier by explaining to police, for instance, how social movements work. That's something that is, I think, very important. Um, I know for a fact, and I could show on, 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 a, on a flow chart, uh, leftist academics, people who do research about social movements we're familiar with, that is then farmed by the FBI to infiltrate and arrest and marginalize those social movements. So we have to make sure that the work we use doesn't have dual use, right? It's called dual use technology, right? The idea that you can, you can buy a, you know, a, a gas canister and make it into a bomb, thus that gas canister is dual use technology. Our research is dual use technology. But if I do a, a report on, uh, on my, you know, my local anarchist um, direct action group that every once in a while throws rocks at a police station, right? There's an obvious policing usage for that research. So we have to be very careful that the, research, that the knowledge we produce does not endanger the social movements or the entities that we're trying to protect or promote or advance. And I think a lot of us do that unintentionally. And I think that that's, and, I, and I'm, 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 I've done that myself, no, no question. And again, one of the things that's scary to me is I've read a lot of um, state, state literature, FBI documents and whatnot, which say, you know, we're trying to figure out how to infiltrate this, you know, you know, Earth Liberation Front cell or this whatever. And we just looked at a bunch of lefties who wrote on these movements and we figured out great inroads. You know, that, that data is there. It's not a theory. Um, so this is, in a sense, my proposal. Um, so this is in a picture of social network analysis. This is a very common way in which people do research. We should not do this. Not about things that we like. If we want people to be arrested, sure, do this. But don't do this of the anti-war movement. Don't do this of, 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 of things that you don't want to end up in the hands of police. Because not only are you saving them time, but your knowledge is probably better than their knowledge. Um, so here, I'll, I'll leave this up. These are some of the articles, which, which there's uh, some articles which are, this is based on largely. Um, the Jean Genet one I didn't talk about, but it's a great example of some of this too. Um, here's my email address, and, and I said this uh, again, but um, I post all of the work that I do, all my publications online for free. I think that's really important. I would love it if that was a common practice. I realize the issues with copyright. I, that, maybe that's why I'm contingently employed. Um, but I would suggest people do it. This is where I post mine. It's all free. You have, you have to make an account, but it's, it's free. So if you want to see any of this, I have um, most of this online. Okay, guys? So thank you.